This week on Sportsman TV, we're in McGann's, Louisiana on assignment, on a deer hunting assignment. That's right, we're gonna get to shoot some deer this week, hopefully. Um, we have an opportunity to hunt a piece of property that's being managed. We're hunting coal bucks, we're hunting does. Both of them eat just as good to me as a giant hammer. And so, uh, couldn't be a better week this week on Sportsman TV. Come with us. We're here with Dave Moreland this week, a uh, world-renowned deer expert from the state of Louisiana. And uh, we have a, have a real good opportunity here today. It's a piece of property that's being well-managed. And uh, Dave's gonna tell us a little bit about that and what it takes to get started into deer management, uh, depending on your size of property, what kind of forage, how your neighbors are. We're just gonna kind of ask him some questions and uh, let him tell us what we need to do. This is a 1,200 track of, of land here in Point Capee Parish. It's uh, Area 6, which Area 6 has the late breeding season in our state. Basically, January and February are the two peak months of breeding activity. This track has actually been under good management for several years. It adjoins another track, which is uh, uh, three to 4,000 acres in size. And they've all been in DMAP. Uh, the, the goal has been to harvest quality deer, you know, not necessarily the trophy class deer, but a good, you know, 130 to 160 class deer. Uh, they, they control the doe harvest here. They, they try to shoot a specific number of does. Of course, the habitat, this is bottomland hardwood, some of the best habitat in the state with adjacent agriculture. So that agriculture uh, really boosts the, the nutritional uh, value of, of this land and allows for some good growth and development and allows you to produce some quality deer, whereas in the Piney Woods, where I am, we don't see this kind of uh, body weights and antler growth uh, in our, on our habitat. Now, when you're on the DMAP program, is it, how do they decide how many deer, like, or how many tags you get right, for the right. amount of acreage yeah. you have? Uh, it, it's done a couple of ways. The big way, of course, is to look at the habitat, look at what browse is available, look what the deer are eating, and from the, uh, browsing that you see you can say well the deer population is really high when it's high you start seeing that browse line right and you start seeing all your browse plants being hammered uh, if it's moderate you know you see good browsing which tells you there's no reason not to shoot does if when you do the transect line and looking at your habitat you find very few bites uh, on your plants and you say well something's not right here maybe the population is too low and, and this area could have more deer. This is what we would call moderate, moderate browsing. It's not over browse, good browsing, and so there's no reason at all not to harvest does. Another way is to look at your data, look at each age class, your six months, year and a half, two and a half, both the male and female uh, uh, population groups and then see, are we getting the growth and development that we're trying to achieve here? On this property, you would at least want to see uh, a male fawn weighing 60 pounds or better. You want to see him as a year and a half old, weighing 120 pounds. And those two and a half year old deer, you want to see them 150 to 175. If your body weights aren't showing that, then you start thinking, okay, why not? Is it because of habitat problems? Is it because of too many deer? Is it a combination of both? So basically on the big scheme of things, deer management, you get to shoot more deer. Overall, yes, yeah. you get to shoot more deer than what traditional deer management where you don't shoot the does. Now, from the buck standpoint, you probably don't get that high buck kill, but under traditional deer management, 80% of what you kill are year and a half old deer. Right. They, you know, they, they had their first set of antlers, and so, so you trade off uh, a few more, a little less bucks, but a little better, much better quality animal. Yeah, I can remember growing up when we shot everything. Oh, yeah. And when somebody killed one of those 15 inch eight points, they drove it around in the back right, of the truck exactly. and showed yes, it to yes, everybody. Yes, and and yes. it's just funny how we're evolving as deer hunters and 
right. more and more people are getting yeah, in on you, the deer management. We see that a lot today. In fact, a lot. In fact, I'm I'm telling people. You probably need to shoot a few more bucks on your on your property. You know, look at look at what's going on. Shoot those low end bucks in each age class. Kind of a slot limit with fish. Right. Let the better ones pass, and then the really good bucks. You know, that's the one you're trying to grow. You know, shoot them. And as I said, I, uh, under the DMAP program, all all deer have to be tagged and before they're removed from the uh, site of kill. So you'll have a tag with you. And you're to uh, tag that deer immediately, right? Tag the you... deer before it's it's carried out. Yeah, correct. Well, we we're gonna enjoy it. It's gonna be a good time this I week. I hope so. It's not a great day, but I think I think deer will be moving. It's the right time of the year for that. If we this area, the bucks are definitely in the rut chasing the does, correct? Well, come join us, see what happens. This is Ryan Terrio. I'm here at Bowie Outfitters, and listen, I'm an avid bow hunter. If you're looking for a place with the best service in the South and wonderful accessories, not to mention a top of the line bow range, Bowie Outfitters is a place for you. A wonderful staff here and great service at Bowie, but an awesome selection of guns. We have pistols, rifles, and shotguns, and everything else you could imagine. And for all those hard to find bass fishing and inshore products, Bowie Outfitters is a place for you. That's Bowie Outfitters for everything outdoors in between Essen and Blue Bonnet on Perkins Road. Parish, Louisiana. Dig in. Do you want the better selection and bigger savings? Service Chevrolet Cadillac has the largest inventory of Chevys in Louisiana. You can choose from over 300 Silverados, all in one location. The Chevy Silverado has the best pickup coverage in America and the lowest cost of ownership of any full size pickup on the road. Shop the better selection and get bigger savings at Service Chevrolet Cadillac, 1212 Ambassador Caffrey, or visit us at servicegm.com. Tis the season, whether hunting or holiday, ShopSportsmanStore.com has what you want. Featuring new in-the-field performance shirts that provide maximum comfort while you look cool and stay dry. Whether on the boat or in the woods, be seen with our new Blaze Orange performance hat. Without leaving your home and the click of the button, you'll be on your way to buy the gift of camo this season. Check out our camo hats with Realtree Max 4 Camo and our camo shirts, short, sleeve, and long. Shirts, hats, sunglasses, jewelry, wallets, and decals. ShopSportsmanStore.com. Sportsman, it's who we are. Well, just like other states, Louisiana, uh, habitat loss in the late 1800s, early 1900s, with all the land clearing, market hunting still going on, uh, very few restrictions as far as hunting laws and regulations. So the deer were hammered. Most of the deer in this state were in the swamp type areas, the river areas where hunters couldn't get to them real accessible. And, and that's where the mainstay of the hunting in the early 50s went on. If you look back at the old conservationist magazines and sports magazines, you'll see a lot of it in the swamp hunting. And a lot of it was done with dogs. Restocking began in the 50s, it continued into the 60s. And by, the, by 1970, the state had been restocked with deer. And by 1970, most of the state was still, was, was open for some type of deer hunting. And by 75, all of the state was open for deer hunting. And so that just came along at the right time and high deer numbers and, and, and uh, here's a new animal to hunt. So, you know, a lot of people got excited and started hunting. Uh, basically, uh, deer sightings and looking at the habitat and that what is what drove the restocking. You know, they would go in an area, find very little deer sign, but suitable habitat. Okay, so they make a release there. They might go 20, 30 miles away, make another release, making small releases. And, and from that, deer finally um, started to uh, grow and expand. Most of the restocking in this state, uh, the deer came from the old Chicago Mills game man management area, Madison Tinsaw Parish. 
the Red Dirt Preserve, Game Preserve, which is part of the National Forest System. And then from the uh, mouth of the Mississippi River, uh, the, the Delta and Pasalute Refuge, they learned that they could take helicopters, push the deer into the water, and then using uh, boats, uh, air boats, kind of round up the deer, catch them, put them in the boat, hog time. And uh, there was several hundred deer trapped and released uh, like that. Well, you know, we started off the edge, and there was a handful of deer tracks, a little bit of deer sign. We actually saw a couple old scrapes. As we've gotten farther back in the woods down this old gas line, there's a, there's a big acorn crop. And there's, you can tell where deer have been feeding on acorns. Also, as we've gotten down here, we've seen some deer rubs. This is actually a, a big deer scrape. It's got some deer tracks in it. You can see here where the deer is rubbing. On, uh, they just leave their signpost. Now, if you can tell, these scrapes haven't been worked since the rain but we're more so into the peak of the rut and they have a tendency once you get into the peak of the rut they don't scrape as much they don't come back and check them and fresh them up now the deer is either with a doe or he's hunting does there's enough does in he doesn't have to come back and check his scrapes he's just he's cruising that's when the cruising phase is you know he's walking around out there you know chasing does and, and looking for hot does because a lot of does are in now so uh, it's a good sign we're getting in an area it's got a lot of deer really warm, probably pushing 70. I mean, it is as worst conditions as you can imagine on a deer hunt. I mean, you know, I'm thinking frog, buzz bait. I mean, somewhere the fish are blowing up on the top water today. Um, you know, it just makes deer movement hard. They don't have to get up and move around. And also the property is really thick. So if they are just getting up and moving around a little bit, you know, you, you can't see. You know, they, they need to come into one of these shooting lanes for us to see them. And, uh, you know, it's just something you deal with. And when you get the opportunity to go, you take that opportunity because, you know, we're really fortunate to get to hunt at a place as good as this one. We just, you know, we can't control Mother Nature. That's just something that happens. You know, this may be the first time in history that two things are going on at the same time. We've got Dave Moreland, white-tailed deer expert, in a pair of pajamas, cleaning a hog. You can't script that any better than we have it right now. But what he is doing is taking care of the land. And this is one of the issues, you know, when you're trying to manage your property. This is an animal right here that competes with almost all of the native wildlife. Not only does it compete with the deer, I mean, it's the coons, the turkeys, everything, because it, they pretty much eat everything. Who better to tell us about that than Mr. Dave Moreland? You notice I'm wearing gloves. I do. That, that I is the that. recommendation with feral hogs is that you wear gloves. Uh, and, and they even recommend it now with deer that you wear your gloves. Uh, don't be smoking and drinking or eating <laughs> while you're cleaning. You know, try to avoid uh, things splattering on you. And then once you have finished the process, uh, take a Clorox solution and clean your utensils. You know, don't, don't just rinse them off. Uh, try to sterilize them too. What are some reasons that you find that it's important to remove these from your property? Uh, feral hogs, of course, have become a, a real issue for landowners across the southeast. And in Louisiana, uh, it's, we're like many other states. The problem has just escalated. And feral hogs will root up the, the landscape. Uh, you, you try to have a food plot, grow something, and they'll root it up. And that's one of the big problems is, is deer do not like to feed where, where pigs are. And uh, that's, a, that's a real problem and getting to be a problem. A lot of people think their deer sightings have declined because of pigs uh, on their property. What are some things that you recommend on removing or trying to remove yeah. the hogs from your property? Well, of course, in this state, it's legal to shoot them year round. So anytime you can, shoot them. Uh, a pig is a smart animal. So once you start putting pressure on them, uh, they go nocturnal. From the end of deer season to the beginning of deer season, shoot them at night. You don't have to get a permit. And I do that on, on our property. I'll, I'll put up a bait site, put up solar lights, put my cameras out. And when I, when I see that they're coming regular, get in the deer stand, it's a little, that's kind of fun. It's kind of exciting sitting right. there in the dark and all of a sudden, here's a pig pops into the light, you know, and you shoot it. 
but uh, shooting is somewhat limited. Trapping is probably the best way. Uh, and, and there's a lot of different traps on the market, usually a corral trap, a larger trap where you can catch a big group of pigs. It's much better than, than those smaller traps where you only catch a handful because once that trap door falls and there's pigs on the outside, you've educated those pigs and they, they become very trap shy. So the hog dogs, using dogs, that's another way to do it. That's kind of more of a sport too than, than and you know, it, it will work to some extent, but you probably need to use all those techniques on your property. All to three of those, those to, to really do any. All, correct, yeah. So, <clears throat> It's just pretty something that we're going to have to deal with on our own. As sportsmen, yeah. we're going to have to deal with it on our yeah, own. Yeah, and, and you know, a lot of people like them. You know, it's another game animal. You know, it's considered another game animal to shoot. The meat is excellent, cooked properly. You know, they, you can't get any better eating than that. So, uh, but they do, uh, the, you know, the, the damage they cause on the landscape, it is, it is detrimental. Why Bowie Outfitters? Our customers know why. When you need something, you come in, you ask for it, and you can get it. Great selection of clothes here, guns, shells, calls, whatever you need. I like coming in and doing that. And more importantly for me, I'm a big bow hunter. I think these guys are better than anybody. That's why I come over to Bowie Outfitters. That's Bowie Outfitters. Perkins Road between Essen Lane and Blue Bonnet. Bowie Outfitters, for everything outdoors. For camping, fishing, hunting, or anything outdoors, bring along Arctic Ice. Simply freeze these versatile cooler packs and they're ready to keep your food and drinks cold throughout your outing. Arctic Ice can maintain in a cooler 60% longer than the equal weight of regular ice and with no more mess or soggy food. Arctic Ice is clean and easy. Alaskan series can maintain a sub 40 degree cooler for days and the Tundra series can keep game frozen till it gets home. Preserve an Arctic refuge in your cooler. Choose Arctic Ice. How do you improve on the Evo? You start with its DNA. Then engineer a bow that is fast, lightweight, and features the best technology. The center lock two pockets are highly adjustable, light, and quiet. The riser forged from ultralight aircraft aluminum creates a bow that weighs a mere 3.7 pounds. The flex cable slide flexes during the draw cycle, relieving lateral torque. And the core hybrid cams deliver a blistering 352 feet per second. Introducing the new Dream Season DNA. Experience PSE. Experience performance. Louisiana Sportsman Magazine. For over 31 years, your source for fishing and hunting information. Each month you will find stories by local experts on everything from bass to redfish to ducks, deer to trout and turkey. We've got incredible local information that you can use immediately to get more success outdoors. You'll also enjoy monthly columns on cooking, the latest lures, GPS locations, shooting, kayaks, and much more. Have Louisiana Sportsman delivered to your house and safe. $24.99 gets you a full year of Louisiana Sportsman. To order today, visit louisianasportsman.com. Yeah, what, what you're looking at here is some uh, uh, Durano clover that, that he's planted. This is, uh, clover is, is a real good uh, quality forage, high in protein, and it, it comes up during the winter, and this particular clover will stay viable into the summer as long as we get some moisture. And, and so there's a lot of forage here, uh, both native and uh, the planted clover. Here's a, here's some verbena, and you can see that it has been browsed. This is one of our native plants. Here's some rubus, which is one of the high quality plants on this property, and you can see the stems, the leaves have been browsed on it. Of course, along the edge, you got your, your, your briars, some more rubus, and uh, you can see where the leaves Deer have been, you can see here, here they've been browsing, pretty heavy browsing along the edge. And, and, and this is what you call the edge effect, where you, where you have uh, two habitats, you have the open habitat comes to the woods and right on the edge where you get a lot of sunlight, you get a lot of this quality forage right here. And we're looking at, at one of the food plots and you can tell it, it's, it's just recently been made, you still got some palmetto growing out in it. but. You see how the, the winter grass is in rows. It's been row planted with a machine and uh, call it drilling. He's drilled the wheat. And what we have in this plot, we have wheat, we have chicory, and then we also have the clover, uh, the clover mix. 
So you've got diversity of uh, food items. You get immediate food from the winter grass, the good quality nutrition right now, and then in the spring when you need the protein for the, for the next year's growth and development, you have that. And, that. and that's what you need to do when you think about food plots. You need to think of it year round. Winter plantings to attract the deer to help facilitate the harvest. And then your spring and summer, which is providing the nutrition, that's when the nutrition really comes into play and is real critical. all of a sudden turned and moved to our right and we just did not have a good clear open shot and they've gone into the woods now and kind of hoping maybe they'll slip down the edge here and then maybe pop back out again. Uh, we'll wait and see. When the temperature is below 60 and the barometer is 30 or better, I'm staying with it because those are good um, times for deer to be active. Uh, in, our, in Louisiana with the Gulf Coast environment, it is, it's really a challenge to try to pattern deer. Uh, you know, you get a front, a front may last two, three, four days and then it's gone. Warms back up 70 to 80 degrees and, and, and deer constantly are changing. Uh, yeah, we need to feed when it's 40 degrees, now it's 80 degrees, we don't need to feed. We'll come out at night and we know where the corn is and we just feed at night when it's a little more comfortable to feed. And, and that's kind of what we saw last year with that very mild winter. Deer activity just went to zero. Uh, deer moved a lot at night. Uh, so uh, it's not like hunting in the Midwest and North where you get a distinct winter and where you know deer are gonna feed, they're gonna move, and you can pattern them like that. Going in the woods? Oh yeah, I saw it. Okay. I don't see nothing else coming yet. Is that her? Yeah, she's in the middle. She's stepping up. She's closer. So what we're going to do now is take the dog and see if we can find the deer. Uh, it's pretty wet, so the blood, what we couldn't find the blood, but if the deer's in the briars where we couldn't go, the dog can go there, and the dog certainly will get a whiff of it if, if, uh, if it's in there. So we're going to go find out. Come on, buddy. Yeah, we're probably 100 yards from where the shot was uh, across a dry slough that normally would have water. Uh, looks like <laughs> it's a throat <laughs> shot <laughs> with very little blood. That's why we could not find any blood. So, uh, But she's a good adult doe. This is what we're trying to get. We'll be able to look at a reproductive tract and determine whether she's uh, probably has not ovulated, but hopefully maybe uh, we can determine that she is getting close to uh, developing her eggs and maybe in two or three weeks would have ovulated. So, but she's a good healthy doe. Without a dog like this with a nose, we, we would not have found this deer. The buzzards would have found it, so. The doe weighs, say, 89 pounds, point a little bit over 90 pounds, which a three and a half year old doe would probably like to see it weighing 120 pounds. Well, we're looking at uh, the statewide average for this type of habitat. This is bottomland hardwood habitat in Louisiana. And it's, it's good habitat, good bottomland hardwood forest, and you have a lot of agriculture, row crop agriculture associated with that, the farm country. 
And so we look at our state average, which I think is, is probably somewhere close to 120 pounds for this habitat. So we compare this habitat, bottomland habitat, with the state bottomland habitat, and it's way below what, what it should be. What we're fixing to do is uh, open her up where we can see her uterus and, and where the ovaries are. Uh, uh, a lot of hunters are interested in what's going on from a reproductive standpoint. And all of this is kind of right in front of you. We've dropped down the stomach and the intestines, and now what we have is the reproductive tract. Here's the urinary bladder, the vagina, that goes down into the uterus. There's two horns, it, 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 it forks. So you've got a, a right and left, and as you come out here, here is the ovary. And that's what we're looking at. Uh, it looks like there's a little activity going on there as far as the egg development, and doesn't look like as much on this side. You can see this, this ovary looks much larger than, the, uh, than uh, the ovary on the left side. And so uh, it looks like the follicles, the eggs are beginning to develop. Uh, so probably in, in two weeks or so, an egg or two, several eggs would develop. They would rupture and they would get into these fallopian tubes where they would be uh, fertilized by the buck. The breeding, when she ovulates, She's in estrus, she's in heat, and that's when breeding occurs. The rut actually begins prior to that. It, it involves the, the males, the social fighting that goes on, uh, establishing who's the boss. And then as they begin working their scrapes, the does come to the scrapes, and we, we saw that on her tarsal glands, uh, they're, they, she's been urinating on her tarsal glands and probably has been urinating in scrapes which that kind of stimulates them to ovulate also. So uh, all that process, uh, it's an involved process as far as a rut. And then when she's getting close to having her estrus cycle, the buck, that's when he really begins hounding in her. He may chase, be with her for two or three days chasing her. Finally, she has her heat cycle, which lasts 24 hours. They breed. He might stay with her another day or two, and then he's off trying to find him another, another uh, doe. You know, nobody said deer management's easy. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of hard work from, from planting the food sources, uh, shooting the does back, shooting the right bucks, letting those quality bucks walk, you know, shooting more inferior deer or deer that, you know, we don't find as eye appealing, you know, as those big horn deer. I mean, there's a lot goes on to it. it. It is not an easy deal, and it's not for everybody. But for the people who can stay out there, you know, and put in the time and the hard work, you know, I think the payoff is, uh, you know, twofold.